can start the recording, Ellie. All right. We're here in our larger conference space that will look a lot different once we get permanent furniture for this space. But Not our just a conference room was getting a little tight with uh, folks showing up to um, to observe and, and public comment. So <coughs> we thought this might be a little bit easier for people to breathe. <laughs> Shoved a couple of desks together. Yep. So we're ready to rock, Jacob, whenever you are. All right, sounds good. Uh, yeah, so we'll call the meeting, um, the St. Louis subcommittee meeting to order at 12.04 p.m. Eastern. Um, with us today, we have um, Nellie Marvel and Kyle Harris from the Cannabis Control Board. Um, who else do we have in the room there? We've got five members of the public. Five members of the public um, from NACB. We have myself, Jacob Pollitzer. Um, Megan House is going to be taking the meeting minutes, um, as well as Gina Grimwinkle. Um, and then for the subcommittee, uh, uh, yeah, I guess on the subcommittee we have Stephanie Smith and Billy Coster, joined by Anna Burakowski. Burakowski? Um, yep. it's, it's, oh, on, it's actually Anna. Anna. Sorry about that. Anna, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Josh uh, Kelly. Um, so with that, uh, first order of business would be to um, review and approve last week's meeting minutes. Um, sorry it took a while to get that out to everyone. It was quite a, quite a lot to go through. Um, make sure kind of everything was uh, concise and, and made sense. Um, Stephanie and Billy, have you had a chance to review it uh, prior to the meeting? Yeah. I went through it quickly. Yep. Yeah. I had one clarification on page two on something that I said, that from a farming attic perspective, excess light that is emitted from a greenhouse, um, it, not necessarily related to cannabis, because we currently don't have cannabis growing, so it's just any light, any greenhouse. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, not, you know, currently towns don't have regulations addressing that. So I just wanted to kind of clarify um, that towns would have to actively adopt regulations. Um, okay, perfect. So I'll okay. change that language to, from cannabis act perspective, um, excess light that is emitted from greenhouses is not regulated by the town. Yeah, that currently regulated, yeah. Okay. And just a slight clarification, I think the men say that um, light rarely affects wildlife habitat. And I think what I, I meant, I did say what I meant to say was that um, rarely has light come up as an impact on wildlife habitat in the regulatory context. It's not to say that it, it doesn't, it may not, it, does, it doesn't say that that rarely has an effect, it just rarely has come up in the regulatory context. Okay, good clarification. Yeah, um, perfect. Um, Megan, you have that down in the meeting minutes? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so then with those two amendments, are we good to, someone want to bring to the floor to approve these meeting minutes? So moved. I'll second. Okay, um, all in favor of approving uh, February, I want to say 22nd? Yeah, February 22nd's meeting minutes, say aye. September. Aye. <laughs> aye. Aye. Minute meetings are approved unanimously. Okay. So with that housekeeping out of the way, today we'll be talking about waste, waste standards and waste regulations. Um, I'm really uh, happy that Billy, you brought some colleagues in because, um, you know, in the kind of notes I put together of an overview, kind of like what we're seeing in the industry, um, you know, in every state, um, as far as it comes to like waste, waste management for, I guess, Mostly, I think today we're going to be talking more about solid waste, um, you know, defaults to what's already in place on the state level, um, so local, state, and federal. And so I think it'd be great to, you know, start the discussion um, on kind of what Vermont has in regards to regulations that cannabis businesses would have to comply with. Um, would it be easier to kind of go through this on a, like a cultivation, manufacturing, um, retail distribution, um, kind of breaking it down that way or breaking it down into like organic, um, composting waste, hazardous waste, recyclable, recyclable, single use kind of stuff. Um, but I like kind of defer to you since you're the resident expert on these things. 
And I'm going to kind of pass the question along to Josh and Anna to see if they have a suggestion on how best to parse this out. And then I'm going to weigh in and say I like it broken up by, by uh, the activity personally. <laughs> then I'll let others comment. <laughs> okay. Well, I can comment on hazardous waste regardless of whether it's in processing or sales because that's the, the part that I regulate. So I think if you want to hear from us by what we regulate, it would be better to break it into hazardous waste and solid waste and keep that separate because Josh and I will be speaking for respective program. Okay, and Josh, is your expertise in, uh, I guess, what, what is your expertise? I, yeah, no thanks. I'm in the solid waste program. So okay, perfect. I'll, I'll do my best to speak to solid waste today. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think um, now that I'm actually looking at the notes I put together, um, I have it broken down by, um, uh, I guess, business type, and then in that hazardous and non-hazardous. So I guess we can kind of take it from the top um, and write kind of in your wheelhouse, Stephanie, would be cultivation. Um, so I guess uh, to start off, Stephanie, maybe if you want to um, talk about how you're seeing um, non-hazardous waste in hemp coming to, to play, um, specifically, I guess, with um, organic materials. Yeah, so currently, um, and actually, and Josh can weigh in on this as well, but hemp um, generally, we, you know, we would allow for composting of vegetative waste on the site where the cultivation occurred. Um, and then we would also allow, and that would be covered by the RAPs. We have certain standards that, um, the required agricultural practices, excuse me, um, that address composting of um, agricultural waste, which is specifically defined in the RAPs. I don't have them in front of me right now, but um, that's treated that way relative to wastewater. Um, my understanding, however I'm not an expert, is that outdoor irrigation so long, uh, is not, it's exempt from the Clean Water Act. I don't know, maybe somebody can correct me. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, so, so that's not happening. I, I guess there's no regulatory standard there. Um, I suspect that if there's a, you know, a, a non-point source pollution issue related to agricultural practices, it would be addressed by the RAPs and then point sources direct as uh, addressed by um, DEC uh, and their programs. Um, relative to um, dealing with um, indoor cultivation and the idea of point source pollution, either you know going to a municipal uh, waste treatment facility or going in ground, my understanding, however, I don't believe that there's anything I can point to directly. Um, we would prevent facilities from creating a point source um, uh, contamination event or a source, point source pollution or discharge, I should say, uh, through a conversation between the Agency of Agriculture and DEC if it's not specifically outlined, if it is, you know, like to implement um, best practices to address those issues. Uh, but if it is a point source, discharge then uh, or considered as such then that indoor uh, operation would have to get a permit um, in compliance with rules in place um, yep. so, so that's, th that's my understanding um, and others can correct my understanding <laughs> yeah well, I guess um, to move the conversation a little bit more towards because we're gonna be talking about discharging in water and all of that I think in next meeting so okay. as far as are there um, regulations as far as composting limits of on-site composting or if you're generating X amount of so like um, Massachusetts has a one ton weekly uh, limit that you have to compost um, some other states have it I think Colorado um, is uh, less than that I uh, can't remember exactly uh, but are there regulations like that in Vermont um, that would require cannabis cultivators to have to compost their materials either on site or if they're indoor work with a composter and then i guess the next question for you josh is is there the capacity in vermont to handle you know another three to four thousand tons of organic waste yeah great question um so i uh, i think billy had um translated my response on the what's landfill band before in a powerpoint presentation billy are you, did you Present that previously? I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, essentially, we do have a landfill ban on leaf and yard debris, but that definition 
also includes um, compostable untreated plant and vegetable material. And um, so I can, and I can share my screen on this commentary or this little snippet or Billy can look it up and send it to you all again. But essentially, um, we would consider these crop waste just like any other crop waste and therefore landfill banned if they're compostable and untreated. And so those two terms are what we're using to interpret whether it is landfill banned um, and also whether it's compostable. So for example, if it's treated with some chemical that really falls under Anna's shop, then it's has waste, you know? Or maybe it's regulated by federal law such that it, the composters aren't permitted to take it. Or maybe they won't take it because it will really impact the composting process because of something I'm not aware of. Or it's uh, been treated with uh, herbicides and they don't want to accept it. Um, so we sort of wrote it to be, the definition is such that you can interpret it broadly and that's how we're interpreting it to um, consider that it is a banned, normal plant material would be landfill banned. Mm -hmm. except if it's treated or not compostable in some way, shape, or form. Gotcha. Um, and then the question is, well, where is the capacity? And Stephanie can, find in, can opine on this too, because a lot of this stuff is, you know, farmers generally manage what they produce on their land, in, in historically, corn residues and other things like that. Um, however, this industry might be different um, for many reasons. So we do have an active composting network in the state, um, and we do have some uh, uh, what we call stump dumps as well, which are sort of more inactive composting, where they're just sort of piling uh, leaf and yard debris and, and, and letting it static, statically sit and, and remove things occasionally from it. Um, but I think we have a, a pretty robust network, but I don't know if they're accepting this material now. And I don't know if Stephanie knows more, if she's had any conversations with our composters. Um, but I would expect it's going to likely be a mix of on-site management, as well as shipping it off-site for those that really don't want to deal with it to, to send to composting. And then mostly composting will be economically beneficial over disposable, at least once you get it to the facility. The trucking is, is a whole other story. Um, and then I can show my screen if Billy thinks it's a good idea with our regulatory uh, guidance on where the where where a composter would trigger uh, a permit from DEC, and I can do that whenever you're ready or. Whatever yeah, that would be great. I feel like I looked at the um, presentation you have, but I don't remember seeing that. Um, so, a couple. I guess before we do that, I probably should have started with you know overall almost every state has required um, a 50-50 mix of THC, THC containing materials, so flour, it even goes down to stocks, et cetera, mixed with 50%. So the language of the law is like unusable and unrecognizable. Um, that really came from Colorado when we started in like 2012 and fearing like the legislator of like people were going to rummage through garbage or that it was a way of diverting into um, either the illicit market or getting in the hands of, you know, uh, people who shouldn't have it, not realizing, you know, nowadays, you know, it's just waste. Um, do you, does the everyone, I guess, on this call have strong feelings or know Vermont is kind of leaning towards that? um in regards to organic waste disposal um that also kind of um is something that we should kind of decide or at least talk about now if that's going to be a requirement so most states have it california was the first to not have it required on um cultivation side so they require it for laboratory waste disposal um retail so like products that can't be sold or were contaminated or something like that uh, but most other states have some kind of requirement um, regarding that, which is you know, double the amount of waste essentially being produced because they'll have different guidelines but mixing it with, you know, at some level it can be mixed with anything. Now they're trying to do it more with like compostable or similar items or at a minimum, you know, uh, medium, grow medium or something like that that, that you know, will, will work. But has there been any discussion on your, in your guys' department on whether or not the state wants to include the uh, that kind of thing? I think that would really be more a question for Kyle around the kind of regulatory public safety piece. I don't think that's something that we discern in our solid waste rigs, unless Josh would suggest otherwise. 
Stephanie, before I weigh in, which all all, yeah. all I would say is, you know, Jacob would present what other jurisdictions are doing. Does it make sense for Vermont? I'd love to get the take of the subcommittee on whether or not we should move in, in that direction, you know, from a consumer safety, public safety perspective, but also from a waste management perspective. Where do we where do we shake out? Um, recognizing that, that we've got a lot of experts in waste management on, on the call here. Um, I was just going to say that USDA and the hemp program, um, as they've envisioned it, the, um, the rules, they, they allow for on-farm disposal of hemp that is non-compliant <laughs> without using a reverse distributor. And, and they allow for you know composting, you know disking into the field, deep burial. They allow for burning, but I know burning is probably not a good option um, at all, so we'll just leave that one out. Um, the uh, so, so they actually offer uh, probably at least four or five different methods that hemp growers can dispose of hot hemp, um, and we could potentially, as a group, apply those measures to this particular crop um, as well. So, but yes, unrecognizable, unretrievable. Those are the terms that that, uh, that they use as well. Um, yeah, that sounds good. I'm in favor of having as little of that as possible um, because I think especially for small farms or outdoor growers you know it's just a lot of um, compliance and regulation um, you know I put down in some of these you know like Massachusetts has this law that like requires two agents of the company have to witness and document the waste handling of it all and so it's just like a big kind of um, you know burden on um, you know small cultivators that have to do that whereas others like in Oregon they actually have to might not be Oregon as much they actually call the state police and the Department of Ag to tell them that they're destroying these things and so I think the less we <laughs> uh, go about those and potentially stick with like what you were saying Stephanie at the last meeting of like encouragement and um, you know not necessarily regulations but this is how you know we want to see it um, one question for you Josh and then I'd love for you to share your screen was with the um, landfill, um, I guess like uh, disbursement or, or you know taking organic material, is that um, at a certain level or just in general? So like all organic material is not essentially allowed to be in the landfill. It's it's in general. There's okay. not a, there's not a size cap. Like no, if you produce this amount, you have to. Do, it's all it's all encompassing. Okay. Um, let me yeah let me share my screen. Okay. And we can talk about the regulatory side, and then we can talk about the local ban. All okay. right. And why so, we're yeah, doing go ahead. It's not some like tipping fees. And you're saying that um, is it cheaper to compost than it is to bring to kind of solid municipal waste? You know, I we don't regulate tipping fees, so I don't have like at my disposal the accurate tipping fees for every facility in the state. So all I can tell you to be completely transparent with this group is that uh, my information is anecdotal, mm -hmm. but from the people I have spoken with and from my years talking with composters, their tipping fees range from nothing for some farm or composters to um, as much as uh, $60 a ton or more in a few cases. Uh, $60 a ton tends to be the high end. Now landfill tip fees vary quite a bit and it really depends on whether you drive it directly to the landfill and how much material you bring um, or if you're driving it to an incinerator out of state we don't have them in state but they are out of state but you know typical landfill fees that I've seen anecdotally you know range from the 70s to the hundreds and above um, and then if you're using an intermediary transfer facility you're, you're, you, there's a lot more cost. That's typically most of our waste goes before you, the resident, your trash gets to the landfill, goes through a transfer facility. So that tipping fee is usually much greater. Um, so it, it kind of just depends. Um, and I generally find that composting could be cost effective. But again, it, the, the, the piece that is, is that we're not talking about is just what the transportation costs are. And those tend to be the highest amount of, of money you're spending is the money to aggregate the material or bring it to the ultimate facility. Um, and we can talk more about that, but that's the anecdotal information I have. Okay. Yeah, I'm just was just wondering if, because um, there's some of the things in anecdotally as well was, I mean, you have the law um, or regulation in place to have to do this, um, but it seems like 
in some states that are encouraging composting, it's a financial decision. So if it's a lot more expensive to compost, they're just going to defer to um, landfill. Um, and so I was wondering if we needed to like expressly like restate, I guess, the um, mandatory uh, organic waste diversion. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like food waste uh, ban laws, there is triggers in some other states for like, if it costs X percent over disposal, then you don't have to do it. We don't have any of that type of, uh, of legislation in our law regarding the leaf and yard debris ban or the food waste ban. So cost doesn't really factor into it. But uh, in general, anecdotally, the cost is, at least in the case of leaf and yard debris, is often and, and vegetative waste in the favor of composting it versus disposing it. Um, there, I'm sure there's exe there's exceptions to that, and again, my, my knowledge is only anecdotal, so and we can spend a whole study on that. <laughs> but what you're looking at, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say real quick, um, before I forget, what are the, do you have recycling facilities in Vermont? Yes, we have sorting facilities in Vermont. We have two recycling, uh, I call them factories really, because they're conveyor belts where our recyclables get sorted. The two largest are in Rutland and Williston, called Material Recovery Facilities, or MRFs. Um, and then most of that material is uh, sent to other parts of the U.S. Not all of it's domestic, you know, used in the state, but it is mostly used domestically. Okay, but there is a sorting, because like, there is, like, anecdotally, um, I know of issues with um, overflow, I guess, recycling, and it being, if it's a cannabis, like a consumer cannabis yeah, consumer packaged good that technically could have residue in it there has been issues with a crossing state lines to go to a different facility but if it is sorted in vermont then that shouldn't be an issue okay yeah we as far as my know there's ample sorting capacity for vermont's recyclables at this time okay perfect um just this this is a cheat sheet that dec put together it actually does need to get updated stephanie might know that there was a law change to the way food waste is managed between on-farm composting it and off-farm composting of it so it does need to get updated but i'm trying to bring your attention to the vegetative farm waste um let me just see one two three four rows down on the exempt side composting vegetative farm waste on a farm from any farm is exempt from our permits um I'm not, you know, Jacob, I'm not very aware yet of the 50-50 rules, and if and I just know that from the DEC solid waste perspective, I don't know that there's been discussions of that. Mainly what you were talking about in other states sounds like other arms of government want requirements that, that then force a different agency to do something. As far as I know from DEC, I don't know of any 50-50 requirement or special management. This is how we treat farm waste and vegetative waste for composting. Um, you can see that there's quite a large amount um, that a small, a small leaf and yard composter can take. If you compost less than 10,000 cubic yards of solely leaf and yard waste and untreated wood residuals, um, you, you can get a, what's called a small registration where you just register once. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really know what types of material we're talking about in terms of tonnage or cubic yards per year, um, but this is the... The regulatory framework we have. Yes, yeah, so I've got some numbers um, for that. It's like um, estimates are like an acre of hemp, so like an acre of cannabis would be about one and a half to four and a half tons of plant material um, that would need to uh, you know, be composted. And then the other figures I got was like um, for every pound of flour, um, you're looking at one and a half, let me just make sure I get this right. Yeah, well, um, sorry, um, for an acre of hemp, you're looking at two to five tons of stock waste or, or material waste. And then for a pound of cannabis, you're looking at one and a half to four and a half pounds of stock or other, you know, non usable biomass. Um, okay. And then Denver in 2019, which, you know, was about the size of the state of Vermont, uh, 650,000 people. Um, had 3,650 3, tons of plant waste. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we have, I, we don't uh, do assessments of our capacity, but um, I, we do have information on who's permitted with us. And there's some, as you can see in the exempt category that we wouldn't have any information on. So it is a little hard to determine like your other question of 
is there a place you could bring it, you know, mm-hmm. that could handle it? Um, I know anecdotally, I've talked to a bunch of hemp growers in uh, kind of northern Vermont, and they take it to a composter, and they said they're beloved by them because, you know, it's good nitrogen-rich material that they can use right. to, you know, really ensure that their compost piles are, you know, composting. Right, right. Um, so th- this is the regulatory cheat sheet, I guess, for right now. It does need to get updated with some info about the food waste change. Stephanie, anything you want to say here? I, uh, or Billy? just want to make sure I'm not talking over you. Yep. Josh, I have a question. Um, this is Kyle. So, composting vegetative farm waste on a farm from any farm is that is that tied to the definition of of a farm, or is that just thinking through vegetative waste on a, a broader level? I just want to be cognizant that technically this is not an agricultural product, so it's a commercial product. So, what might that mean? Could we still expect to cover that from a, and you might not have the answer right now, from a broader perspective of vegetative waste, or does it have to be tied strictly to the word farm? Yeah, Kyle, I'd have to talk with Billy and get back to you on that. That's a good question. That I, I can't quite get uh, my head wrapped around this moment. I think a lot of us are still trying to do that as well. <laughs> um, Kyle, is there anything that the CCB can recommend that would allow for um, a, a, someone who's cultivating cannabis to compost the waste on the site of cultivation? And I, you noticed I didn't use the word farm. Um, so, I mean. <laughs> I would, I would um, hope, or go ahead. I was just gonna say, when I was going through the regulations, um, so like, California has it classified specifically in their waste as cannabis waste is organic waste. Um, and I don't know if they use the word agriculture in there, but a few other states have like cannabis waste is um, commercial organic waste. And so because they have the organic waste, it kind of, I think, goes into that, that system. So um, I think that's how a lot of states have been um, kind of bridging the gap for their you know, organic waste to their hazardous waste, et cetera. So I think it's just like in the in the way you define it in the regulations. There's potentially, um, I mean, using the terms that uh, Josh was using earlier, that cannabis waste is considered vegetative waste. You know, so we don't have to use the word farming. And then I don't. Well, I don't know. I have no idea. But um, never mind. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I hear what you're saying, Stephanie. And I, I just two things to know. Um, I mean, one, we don't, DEC doesn't have oversight of the word farm. That's really in Stephanie's camp. Um, and, and two, we, but we do have that definition of, of leaf and yard debris, which includes, it's actually leaf and yard residuals, and it includes untreated vegetative waste. So, you know, one could gotcha. take an opinion that, that uh, this exemption could apply to vegetative waste, whether from farm or off farm, because we would also consider a homeowner who's composting vegetative waste you know, to be included in this. I will also note that, that this is actually updated. I, I didn't note my, my colleague Ben Gothier did update the bottom that notes the food residual changes in the law that happened uh, last session. So this is accurate. This is this seems like we're in the way. Yeah, one way to think about it is, right, like landscapers run commercial businesses. They may have vegetative materials that they then have to compost. You know, they're not farms. Those aren't agricultural products, but they're still using this schema to dispose of those materials. Mm-hmm. Yep. I think the last kind of thing on this, which is kind of going to Kyle, would just be how is the state considering classifying THC containing material? And can that be composted without being treated in some way? Or, you know, whatnot. I think that's kind of the, the main thing that um, regulation that needs to oversee it. Um, but realizing about halfway through this meeting, I do want to get Anna's um, take. And so if we are, I don't know, is there anyone, anything else anyone wants to say on the kind of the organic side of things? Well, I was just going to, I, I, I totally recognize that, Jacob, and I want to move to Anna. Um, Stephanie, I want to get your take here because the hemp program here existed before USDA legalization of the hemp crop if I'm not mistaken. And so I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective and the legislature's perspective in the context of hemp, if if 
tilling under on-site hot hemp has given any consternation to the legislature, you know, so on and so forth, or or not? Uh, I, 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 yes, we've had a hemp program for many years before, or at least since 2013, before the 2014 Farm Bill passed. Um, and I think we considered it, well, I don't remember when the change was, but I think it was considered farming, so the on-site <laughs> Yep. composting piece is always in play. Um, from USDA's perspective, um, it, it does allow for the, uh, let's see here, plowing under, mulching, disking, brush mower, deep burial of hemp. And I, I think it could just be based on, you know, that individual grower um, activities. I don't know that it would have to be observed by anybody. Maybe it's documented that it occurred. Just Jacob, you just brought up like having to call someone from the state to come and visit with law enforcement. Um, maybe just documentation of that activity is sufficient to to satisfy the CCB with respect to composting stock. Um, you know, and because we're just talking about the waste material. Well, I, well, maybe we're talking about more, but right now we're just talking about the waste material associated with cultivation. Um, yep. So anyway. There will be, um, and it's probably something to talk about later, or we might not need to necessarily get into it, um, but uh, yeah, there is, I'm trying to think of like the terminology, but the um, like documentation, record keeping, kind of management, like the overseeing of all of it, you know, there definitely need to be regulations on that. And I think the more stringent those are, then we don't necessarily need to go the route of the 50-50 or unrecognizable as long as there's, um, you know, uh, regulations around that also like how they're stored does that need to be a lock container or can it be behind a locked fence that kind of stuff starts to come into play um, and, and a lot of things uh, but yeah moving to uh, Anna um, as far as so I was trying to do some research with like Vermont's current regulation so with like I guess in general with cannabis you're gonna see like the e-waste so for the lightings and the ballast and all that containing kind of mercury and, and all of that, and then like the lithium ion batteries, um, does Vermont currently have, or in the regulations that Vermont currently has, would these fall under that and need to abide by hazardous waste disposal? Yeah, so those fall under the universal waste rules. So they're um, managed under an alternative standard. So they're not, they're part of the hazardous waste rules, but they're, there's a separate management standard for them under the universal waste rules. Um, for, so the way um, it works for us, uh, for universe, for handlers that only have universal waste on site, we only require large quantity handlers, which are mostly like recycling facilities, to notify with us. So if you're a business that generates some, you know, small quantity of batteries, or um, like fluorescent bulbs, for instance, fall mercury-containing devices. Um, you would not be required to um, notify with us and be a registered generator, um, which you would still be subject to the um, to the proper management standards that are set in the rules. Okay. Um, and is that covered for, um, I saw that there's like the 2014 primary battery regulations. Does that cover lithium ion? I believe it covers our, our battery, um, um, rules cover all batteries. We have a separate recycling exemption for uh, lead acid. Those are con uh, covered under recycling exemption rather than um, under the universal waste standards. Okay. Um, um, and we're actually, we're, for lithium ion batteries, we are trying to come up with new guidance for those just because it's a relatively new waste stream and it has to be managed slightly differently than um, other batteries um, just because of the fire danger. Um, so we will have um, got more guidance coming out in the next year um, that we'll be sharing with the, the business community. Okay. Um, and then I had questions on, from like a manufacturing perspective and from the concentrate side of things. So that biomass that has, I guess, higher level levels of solvents that would classify it as hazardous waste. Are there other rules to that that go beyond like the federal what was it, Department of um, Waste Disposal, I guess? Um, so, so yeah, so um, we do have under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act or RICRA, so those are the federal rules that we implement at a state level, the hazardous waste rules. Um, flammable or ignitable solids 
um, if they fail the um, ignitability test, um, they would be regulated as a hazardous waste. Um, it really depends uh, for like plant um, matter with with a residual solvent concentration in them. It really depends how much the residual is. And as of right now, we don't have um, any guidance that says like if it's you know five percent or less, it's not regulated. But if it's you know this percent or more, it is because we haven't established that. It would be really useful um, to have that, but that would require some testing. And we're hoping to work with actually a CBD processor and Brattleboro to get some preliminary numbers and that didn't really work out. Um, so right now it's on the generator of the material to make a waste determination to um, determine whether their um, plant material um, needs to be regulated as um, a hazardous waste or not and that depends on the amount of the residual solvent. Obviously any waste solvent from the process is generate, um, that's generated is regulated as a, as a federally listed hazardous waste. Okay. Um, that's good to know. Um, so like, yeah, I'm on that form that I, I created, which is like the regulatory issues to consider. So these are kind of things that states are all over the place. So I wanted to kind of see what everyone's opinions were um, with, um, I guess, going along the lines of classifying cannabis waste that has either like THCA, so that would be in its natural form, so it's technically what we consider like not um, psychoactive, so safer kids, etc. Um, this is more, I guess, conversation on some level for needing of um, child-resistant packaging, but I think that specifically contributes to the amount of waste we'll be generating. Um, uh, what are I guess the state's thoughts or anyone else's thoughts on making differentiation between um, the requirement of child resistant packaging for THCA versus activated products, which would be edibles, concentrates, etc. I think from our perspective, we would want to take the path that generates the least waste possible. Um, understanding there may be other public safety issues that override that concern. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking that the health department may have an opinion about that. So I, I don't I don't want to weigh in. I mean I would agree, like like least amount of waste makes sense, but then I feel like the health department needs to also weigh in regarding public safety. Take take a let me let me run that through the public health committee. And okay. um and we can let them kind of uh, help us decide at the fork in the road which which path we need to go down, one of least waste or one of the most consumer protection. Okay. No, that sounds good because like right now how most states are doing it with that is it's forcing uh, manufacturers or packagers processors to use kind of single use plastic because like the way they snap closed and so like I always use the example like mason jars are not legal to use but that's one of the most you know reusable um, materials in there and potentially having them clean in to be able to depending on how you end up doing your point of sale retail systems you know being able to bring a jar in and you know not even starting that waste but right now um you know that's not necessarily um you know realistic unless you do exit packaging which a lot of states have started to do or started to do and have moved away from um which is just requiring another opaque child resistant package when you leave the dispensary which is really just generating a whole another stream of waste um and kind of along the lines of like the pharmaceutical, you know, if you have a pharmacy, they always put it in that bag. It can be as simple as like stapling it or some have to actually have like a child resistant cinch um, to it. Um, but yes, yeah, so those are things to consider. I guess, uh, Josh, I have a question on recycling and recyclability. Um, are there minimum sizes for products that the actual recycler can, like the grades that they use to sort it, will stay in there and not just follow the bottom and automatically kind of go to the landfill? Are there, um, I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the answer is yes. And it's the it's the rule of two. Um, the, the, the MRFs, the material recovery facilities, do not want any material um, under two inches in at least two directions. So it can be a two-dimensional item. Think of your yogurt tub lid which is almost two dimensional. It's a little thicker than that. It has a thickness, of course, but mm -hmm. it has to be beyond two inches in any two directions for the for it to not fall through the screens as you're talking about. Or would you 
be in favor of either guidance or regulations um, putting in a minimum requirement for that because that's something we've seen a lot of with uh, pre-roll tubes or gram of concentrates are smaller and they just can't be recycled and so trying to get as much recycling material from a consumer like uh, product into that stream um, I mean I it's rare that I'm asked about a very specific industry regulating it on requiring the recyclability of something in the very specific industry. Um, and so I would just say that we, we generally look much higher uh, at our level of regulations and, and also policies and promotion. We're in favor of recycling for sure. We have state requirements. We have a ban on certain recyclables that require those to be recycled and are banned from the trash as part of our universal recycling law rollout that is pretty much just concluded in 2020, um, of which the leaf and yard debris ban and the food waste ban was a part of. Um, but I don't think I can say today whether we would require a specific industry to meet a specific standard. Okay. Um, so I guess yeah. maybe not required, but as like, a, I guess an educational piece, I think would be helpful because we are, you know, you have to give this industry kind of everything, especially with the compliance and labeling um, aspects of things. Um, and also is thinking with what is able to be recycled, like the numbers of plastic um, yep. as well, and trying to guide the industry to, you know, as much of a standardization as possible, or at least what can actually be recycled. I think. Yeah. And, and as you probably know, just a little bit about the pharmaceutical industry with pill bottles, they're generally mm -hmm. small. They're often not recyclable. Um, and that causes a lot of people to be who really residents who want and customers who want to do the right thing can't because of some of the material that they're in and the reuse of those materials is highly um, pro prohibited because there's different medicines going into bottles and people's privacy and HIPAA so it, it kind of unravels a whole a whole thing but I can certainly say you know we ban uh, plastics one and two in the state from food and beverages um, and beyond that, we don't we don't ban any other plastics. Our local governments have the right to put in their place their own ordinances on landfill bans, and some of them do. I'm not aware of any of them that that have banned other plastics. But more on the voluntary side, they they accept usually at least one through five. But I guess the short again anecdotal information is the valuable plastics remain numbers one, number two, and number five. Mm -hmm. If you're going to use glass. Um, you can use glass, the, the, those are recyclable. Um, the material is not always used to the highest and best use that people might hope. The fact of it going back into bottles is rare these days. Um, so a lot of it is used for aggregate uses like sand, you know, as a, as a grit material. Whether that's for sandpaper, whether that's in paint fillers, whether that's in road base, concrete, you name it. Uh, a lot of the material goes for that. So happy to help. But, can take this off. With that all said, if there are options for packaging materials, we can provide some guidance on which types of plastic and sizes amongst those options are most preferable. And then a couple more questions, I think we have to open it for uh, public commenting, would be, are there incentives right now to, like, I guess, on some of this, I saw Vermont has uh, extended producer responsibility, I guess it's for paint and maybe like one other thing. Um, is that something that's in the future, kind of coming down the pipe? Um, I'm thinking of just like take back schemes for these, you know, materials to be able to try to either reuse them if possible, or at least have one collection point to then bring it. Um, so I was wondering if there's things in place already in Vermont. Um, and then also like, is there guidelines on requiring or encouraging a certain amount of recyclable fiber material in the packaging? Um, so 30% like post-consumer paper or something like that. Yeah, that's a great question, Jacob. We have um, five EPR extended producer responsibility programs currently in the state. Paint, as you said, uh, batteries, which is primary batteries, meaning your, your non-rechargeable batteries. Um, electronics, really your televisions, computers, and printers. Um, mercury bulbs, the, the ones that you and Stephanie were talking about, and mercury thermostats. Those are our five, we call them special recycling because they shouldn't go in your blue bin. There are drop off locations specific to that. Um, so we're trying to keep those separate for the public. Um, and there is a bill proposed on extended producer responsibility for paper and printed packaging um, at the legislature. I don't know if that will, I, I cannot predict what will happen with that. Um, it has been discussed. 
Um, I don't know if there's been an introduction of a minimum post-consumer recycled content bill. That could be in the, but we have none of those laws currently. Okay. Uh, so there's not a requirement. We encourage post-consumer recycling content and, and we encourage uh, sort of the, the reuse opportunities or take back that you're talking about that can be done voluntarily. And we have many examples of that. We have milk that comes in, as Stephanie knows, in reusable um, glass jars. I have one downstairs. <laughs> And then I guess the last thing, and then I'd love Anna to kind of just talk if I forgot anything or if you have anything to kind of say on the hazardous waste issue, but with um, trying to like incentivize purchasers, I guess, so manufacturers or processors to have to buy the more recycling option, I guess, because it's really hard in the cannabis industry with like 280E and not being able to take kind of um, regular deductions. Um, and so one of the things like, I've talked about some industry folks would be if the state could incentivize them paying the extra cost to get a more environmentally friendly product, um, you know, like a reusable glass if that's legal, because you're like, going to accrue higher costs. Uh, pretty much like cost savings really happen in the packaging um, area. So trying to encourage more grows to kind of choose the more responsible, most likely the more expensive packaging. Um, does Vermont have anything like that already in place? or? I think you said this was a question for me. Oh, I was going to say I wanted to pose this oh, question. Okay. I wanted to get um, your opinion just um, on I mean, the space in the cannabis industry and just like. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of packaging, we really don't have anything like that in place. We certainly work with our generators to um, encourage them to, if there is a, you know, a better, like a more environmentally uh, friendly solvent, for instance, or. You know, we, we would encourage them to do that. I think with salt, um, with extractions, it's really, it seems like it's either CO2, oil, or solvent. So two of the, those materials are not regulated as hazardous and do not generate hazardous waste, but um, only one of them does. But um, in terms of, you know, a more environmentally friendly, ignitable solvent, like we don't really necessarily have a suggestion for that because it's, it all would be regulated This is ignitable solvent that would all need to go for incineration. I would say the solvent runs the gamut of, yeah, like just water to CO2 to ethanol to propane, butane, um, even naphtha and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think I think for us, we always encourage facilities to look for ways for recycling the, pro the, the solvents that they're using. So there's a way to um, um, get a recycling system so they can reuse the solvent and have just minimal waste amounts. We would certainly encourage that. We don't have a program that specifically, like, you know, provides them like grant money to purchase the equipment. At least not not in my shop. Okay. I'm not sure if there are other agencies that that have programs like that. Gotcha, Stephanie. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, that I was thinking about that earlier when we were talking about solvent is, is the CCB and I, you know, just an, an option is could require the systems to centrifuge out solvents to the extent possible so that they could reuse it. I know at some point it's not no longer usable, but that would have twofold. It would potentially, however, we haven't established an ignitable standard. Um, it would help in uh, reducing ignitability and maybe if you have that piece of equipment you would meet the ignitable standard so that's not considered hazardous waste um, so there's that possibility of making those links um, that serves multiple purposes um perfect i guess we'll open it up to public commenting i don't think we have any i asked around unless anybody has okay. changed their mind um i did have a couple um a couple of thoughts. So, you know, the, the issue of child resistant packaging, single use pla packaging, pop tops, and, um, you know, environmental conservation, you know, the, it's my, you know, perspective that um, 164 was passed from a um, youth prevention, consumer protection perspective. I think obviously a lot of what might make sense from an environmental perspective might come into conflict with that, but I would imagine that you know, the board is likely going to defer to the side of youth prevention and um, consumer protection because that's the, one of the charges that we have written in law. So to the extent that we're able to, to thread that needle, I think that that is something that we should do, but I think we need to err on the side of 
of that perspective. Um, right. And because we have, I have a question on that. Yeah. Because my understanding is like child resistant packaging is for like toddlers, like kids who, if they got into it, could be harmed, you know, by getting, um, you know, taking 100 milligrams of THC. Um, and so I feel like when you're talking about youth prevention, the child resistance packaging doesn't necessarily uh, come into play. I'm thinking like a 10 year old onward, I was going to be able to open almost, not all of them because there's still ones that I can't open, uh, but you know, along those, <laughs> along those veins. Um, Absolutely. And I totally, I totally understand that. And that's where I'm, I'm saying, I just want to remind the subcommittee of that. And I'll run this through public health to kind of gauge their perspective. I don't want to make this impossible to open and, and create more waste to the extent that we're, that we're able to. But um, I know that that was a huge focus of getting this across the finish line. OK, yeah. Did, did um, we talk about the ability to refill containers? Did you guys mention that? Like it was a glass container? Could, and I don't know the sanitariness. I, I know that in the state of Vermont, we do have you know producers of beer that have refillable containers. I don't know if they're refilling them like today, right now, due to um, the situation, due to the pandemic. But I know in the past they would. Um, <laughs> you could bring them in and get them refilled. Uh, so I, I don't, and I don't know if that's a possibility. Um, yeah, Jacob was uh, Jacob was suggesting that, and I think the challenge is whether they need to be childproof or not, whether one has easy access to refillable containers that are childproof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking from the waste perspective, from the pop, the the top thing, the um, the containers, the opaque containers that have the pop top that you squeeze the sides on. Yeah. Still so, contains a glass container. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so that's what I was thinking is you have like the exit packaging aspect where you can, you know, require them to, when you leave, they sort of have to be in the bag so they're kind of reusable. But I think there's just like an opportunity for the industry to standardize some things and get some, you know, values aligned companies to all, you know, kind of agree to a certain container for eights, quarters, ounces, whatever. And then you would bring in the old one because like, there's definitely like quality issues, like if there was mold in there and then it got onto, you know, because you are storing a dried herb, uh, but you would be able to exchange that. So you buy it maybe for $10, you know, the first time, and then you just bring in your, you know, used one and you get a new one. And then you're just kind of closed loop, like kind of, you know, beer bottles in Europe kind of system. And just, we also have a ban on single use plastic bags in Vermont. So there's now a kind of, People, there's a practice of people bringing their own bags into stores, so that could help with the larger, you know, childproof containers. People could get in the habit of bringing those into dispensaries with them. Are, we, are there yeah. any so other jurisdictions doing that, Jacob? I mean, I like the idea. Of, I didn't hear you go. Are any other jurisdictions doing that with packaging? Uh, not necessarily. Um, I have a bunch of growers I work with that do um, like recyclable totes for distribution of like wholesale material to the processor. And so they're like closing that loop there. Um, and uh, so like, you know, they're big kind of community processors. So like, you know, the 20 farms that are bringing in their product to get trimmed or whatnot or packaged, you know, it's all bringing that in and then you get it back and you get your product and so trying to not have to keep using like cardboard boxes and turkey bags and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, that's pretty much like most of what I have. And then the other one is just having the ability to sell and transfer of fibrous materials. There's usually fibrous materials, pretty much any cannabis plant material that could potentially contain THC is kind of classified as hazardous by a lot of state regulations. Um, and so, the new frontier, like Colorado, starting January 1st, 2021, now allows for an exemption of the waste management stream. If you can now um, divert fibrous stocks to the um, hemp um, industrial fiber industry now, which was never allowed before. So try to like remove that from the waste stream. And then I know, I think Oregon allows you to sell um, waste material for research and development. Um, so that can get you to get processed or, um, you know, to like compress to you extract a little bit of oil, but not to be like consumed from my understanding on that. Um, and so there's just like those little things, but I think it just kind of depends on how your department classifies cannabis and cannabis waste. I don't know if there's really a hemp fiber market in Vermont to take advantage of that type of exemption. Stephanie, what are your thoughts there? 
mean, we're trying. We're working on it. I know. I just got <laughs> at this point in time. So. The, the only thing relative to fiber is sometimes when you're, it depends on what the end use is and whether or not there's the market for a specific, like, I mean, stock from cannabis looks very different than hemp fiber grown for fiber specifically. Right. So there's, there's that to juggle with, um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't have a, a use. Um, possibly does, so long as the equipment's in place and there's a market available. So again, we continue to work on that um, in the hemp world. We work with a lot of like paper makers, small paper makers, um, so it makes like a really great, it's actually what our business cards are made out of that and planted with like wild pollinators, but um, I know there's a lot of, you know, paper makers who want access to the stocks um, and usually can't because um, they would need like a cannabis license or something. So I think just facilitating as many ways to close these loops in the waste stream, um, I think is, is, you know, the best way to think about it. Um, all right, so I think that's most of everything I have. So, um, yeah, I am going to try to take the next couple of days and do kind of the regulations we had talked about in the energy and kind of where we're at with this and try to start getting Kyle um, some language. Um, so it seems like we're all in agreement on the organic waste needs to get organic as little regulation as possible. And then it seems like Vermont has all of the laws in place for um, hazardous waste and e-waste and all of that. And then potentially, I think, drafting some regulatory ideas on take-back schemes or guidance options that I guess um, Billy and, and uh, Josh's department could potentially have for the industry. Yeah, and, and I, I just very quickly, I, I like the direction of the conversation from the um, disposal of, of waste, the 50-50 rule, and, you know, kind of seeing if we can make do without it. I just want to, you know, I know in California they exempt cultivators, processors, and nurseries from that render unusable mm -hmm. or unrecognizable um, perspective. And I just, you know, within 164, the only accommodation we cannot make for small cultivators is in the environmental context. So the word exempt there or anything like that might cause some consternation at the board level. So if we can we can draft things and you and I can have a conversation offline, Jacob, about how we can draft things with small cultivators in mind without a, any exemptions from that unusable, unrecognizable language if that's that USDA type of language if we're gonna do that and, or go in that direction instead of the 50-50 rule just so things don't um, hit a roadblock at, at some point. Well, I don't think the 50-50 is mandated. Um, I mean, my understanding was Colorado put it in there because everyone's just really concerned and thinking that, like, one, it'd be a hub for crime. People would be breaking into, you know, dumpsters around, you know, cultivation sites and that, like, people were going to be able to, like, get in and, like, get pounds of weed and, you know, get into the black market. And that's just not the case. And then just every state since has just copied it. Yeah, no, so, and I, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to confuse anybody. I don't, I don't think it's mandated by any stretch. but. Whatever direction we choose to go in, we can't make special exemptions from an environmental perspective for small cultivators. So I just want us to, to think about the industry broadly um, and how we might be able to work around, to the extent that we're able, that language with making sure that it's not overly burdensome from a requiring two agents to witness the disposal and notarize and all this other stuff that other jurisdictions are, are um, doing with waste disposal. Um, yeah. I wanted to, you had, you had mentioned the um, making sure that stock is a category of, of waste that can be introduced into other industries without being classified as cannabis. And if that clarity is needed, I personally would support that as a, or not personally, but as a member of the subcommittee. I don't know if the other, Billy, if you would as well. Just that clarification that stock yeah. can enter into commerce. <laughs> yeah, Deeds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I Billy. Would, I would say I support that. Um, and, and that I think just to the previous issue, you know, Josh has shared with me that many of our compost facilities have the ability to kind of certify the destruction of a of material that that might provide the kind of oversight and security needed without Great. lots of attestations that it's been handled properly. And then we can certainly look at um, the, the composting laws to make sure that regardless of whether these materials are considered an agricultural or a commercial product that they kind of qualify for the, the least path of resistance. Um, awesome. The system. Thank you, Billy. Yeah, Billy, I take it that your expertise is in policy and the language and all of that. Would it be helpful if I put together some stuff? Because there's a lot of, that's definitely not my area of expertise as it comes to the requirements on the oversight and the containers and all of that. So I've got, you know, um, 
for the main states, kind of how they've written it in regards to requirements for permits and sustainability to render, you know, all that to put that together yeah, to see I'm if happy it's to something. Look at that. Was that did you have that included at the end of your notes that you sent out in the advance this meeting? Yeah, so the end of the notes was really just the regulations of Maine, which were kind of sim more simple. Um, and I figured the, the ones I could find in Massachusetts is pretty intense. Um, and then Colorado. And the reason I chose Colorado is because we were the first one and then also had a big change um, in 2021 to the regulations and how they were interpreted specifically because of the unintended consequences of the way waste was um, done. So there, there's like the overarching waste stuff is kind of the first section, and then it goes into the new laws, which are the collection of marijuana consumer waste, and then towards the end is like the newish law and like the um, fibrous industry stuff. Yeah, so I'm happy to look at that, and, and if you want to just point my attention to anything in particular, please feel free to, and I'm happy to help there. And, and I want to make sure Josh and Anna can bail if, if they want to, because we are after one now, so yep. they may have other commitments. So thank you both very much. For yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And Jacob and I will work to get some language before the, the subcommittee Thanks. soon. Oh, yeah, Jacob, feel free to reach out to me directly if there's anything I can. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do. And if anything comes to mind um, that I didn't think about, please feel free to email me or your mobility to pass along to me things that we should be considering. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Nice thank you. to meet you. Thank you. Bye. I guess with that, we can call the meeting to order. Uh, adjourn at, um, what is it, 1104? Um, 104? Yeah, but yeah, I'm free for the next few minutes if anyone wants to keep talking about this, but like officially we can end the meeting. Sounds good. Thank you all. Thank you. Jacob, do you need anything? Um, not for right now. I'm pretty good. Just get it.